We want to keep right on schedule as far as the announced schedule is concerned. For one hour, straight Bible teaching, and then open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ruth. Because of our abbreviated uh, Friday night classes this time, just the two tonight and next Friday night, we thought we would take a very short book and yet study the entire book. If I were to give a topic to this, I thought first of giving the subject as the greatest love story in the Bible. And then I, then I said I can't do that because the greatest love story in the Bible is for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love for sinners. That's the greatest love story of all time, isn't it? But everybody likes a love story. If you don't, then uh, you've just about quit living. I still like love stories. I don't like them to be too mushy, but I still like a good love story. <laughs> and the book of Ruth is a beautiful love story. We see more than just the record of a few people who lived back in the period of the judges. We see actually a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and His love for His church. There are but two books of the Bible named after women. The book of Ruth and the book of Esther. In one, a Gentile woman marries a Hebrew man. That's in the book of Ruth. In Esther, we find a Hebrew woman marrying a Gentile man. This book has so much in it, we cannot begin to go into all the deep spiritual meanings, all the symbols and types which are represented, but we at least can give you some idea in the short time which we have in these Friday class, Friday night classes of that which we have in mind, which we trust will be a blessing to you. The first chapter of the book of Ruth. Remember, it follows just after the book of the Judges, after the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, of course, the first five books of the Bible, with Moses as their human author, followed immediately by Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. And, of course, the first five books of the Bible tell us the history of Israel, in Egypt and after the Egypt during the wilderness wanderings. And then, of course, the book of Joshua gives us the entering in and possession of the land which God had promised their father Abram. The book of Judges follows immediately after Joshua, for there was a period of time in which Israel acted as a theocracy, a theocracy means government by God. And actually, we have the word democracy today. That means government by the people. We have the word aristocracy. That means government by a few. We have the word monarchy, which means government by one man. But Israel during the period of the judges was a theocracy. The Greek word theo means God. And so it was during this period that God worked through judges whom he would raise up in times of declension and call the people back from their spiritual downgradism. We found inevitably that the book of Judges centers around three words. Sin, declension, spiritual declension, or sin. Second, restoration under a judge whom God would select to lead his people and to call them back in repentance to the God of their fathers. 
And then as a result of the, of the return to the Lord, His blessings. That was repeated some 13 times during the period of the judges in which God raised up men as His instruments to govern the people during that time. But it was a constant period of recurrence to sin. As quickly as one outstanding leader would die, the people would go right back into spiritual declension until God must have wearied of their sins. And then you remember the last of the judges and the first of the great prophets was Samuel. It was during Samuel's time that the people wanted a king like the nations round about. God said, I'll give them what they want. If they don't want no longer to be a theocracy, I'll give them a king. The very thing that God's people ought not to ask for is to be like the world, to be like the others round about. God gave them the first proud, splendid king of Saul. And Saul led them into sin. And they reaped the consequences of their desiring a king. God said to Samuel, when he was broken hearted, said, Samuel, don't you, don't you fret. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as their ruler. Well, now it was during the period of the judges, that time of constant recurring of spiritual declension, and then God bringing judgment upon them and calling them back, raising up a new judge. It was during that time that the book of Ruth gives us a little picture of intimate, personal life during the time. All right, the first chapter, the first chapter and the first verse. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the land of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. My, how much God says in few words. It would take a man chapters to state the essential facts that God states in those few lines in verse 1. We know the time in the days when the judges ruled. There was a famine in the land. Now, a famine was not God's fault. Oftentimes people blame God for their times of financial depression and hardship. And very likely there were those in Israel who did, but a famine was not God's fault. The famine was the result of the sins of the people. And in that famine, God was calling the Israel back into repentance. The land of Palestine then, as well as now, was a land of but very few perennial streams. They absolutely were dependent upon rainfall. In other words, they were dependent upon blessings from heaven. And so are we, aren't we? Natural resources there in that land are soon dried up. In a period of drought or famine, the natural resources are absolutely insufficient. And all that man can do in his natural resources soon comes to an end. And man's extremity is God's opportunity. And so that leaves us absolutely dependent upon blessings from above, blessings from heaven. We find not only the period of time in which this book is set, we find where the scene of the opening of the book, it was in Bethlehem in the land of Judah. That strikes a familiar chord, doesn't it? For we read... In Matthew 2, 1 and 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, and so forth. And so we find the setting of this book to begin with. It was in Bethlehem of Judea. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. That's what the word meant. And yet it was not living up to its name because of the sins of the people God had changed Bethlehem from a house of bread to a house of want. And that's exactly what sin does inevitably. I was talking to a gentleman just yesterday, I believe, and he was talking about, it was a general, our general contractor, and he was talking about one of the subcontractors that we had had some dealings with, and he said, that man has gone broke. 
because he said he spent more time in the bars than he did in tending to his business, and his business soon went broke. And so sin in any way, certainly from a spiritual standpoint, oftentimes from a financial material standpoint, changes Bethlehem, the house of bread, into a house of want. And so that's what the famine had done, the sins of the people had done to Bethlehem of Judea, the house of bread. And not only that, but we found that the famine was the natural consequence of the moral condition in Israel at that time. It was not surprising that there was a famine in the land. For over in Judges 21, 25, just a few pages over, we read that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's anarchy, isn't it? That's exactly what certain elements today want to do. These kooky students in so many of our universities, and may I say that it seems to me like we've got a bunch of weak sisters at the head of the schools of this country. If they cannot manage a bunch of kids, they say it's but a small minority. Every time you come, they come on TV, they say, just a very small minority. The great mass of the students here are earnest students and they want to learn and all that. Then why don't they kick that small minority out of the school and not let the rest of us pay taxes to maintain a school, a so-called school where the kids don't want to learn a lot of them? Why don't they kick them out? They don't have the intestinal fortitude. That's the reason. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Yes, that's anarchy. We find the same thing in the spiritual realm today. So many people say, I don't see anything wrong with this. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's not a question of whether you see anything wrong with it. If it's contrary to the Word of God, it is wrong, whether or not you're too blind and stupid to see it. That's the reason we have so many stupid church members. They don't want to see anything wrong in anything they want to do. So this famine was the result of the moral state of the nation at the time. Now, we find that this man, his wife, and his two sons leave the land of covenant blessings. God had promised to bless Abram if he'd go to the land of promise. God never t did tell Abraham to leave it, did he? And when Abram left the place of God's choice and went the way of his own choosing, the way of the line of least resistance, that's when he got in trouble. You remember Abraham left the land of God's promised blessings and went down to Egypt and all the way through the Bible, Egypt is a type of what? The world. So he left the place of covenant blessings and he went down into the world. That's exactly the same thing that Elimelech, as we find his name in the second verse here, Elimelech left the land of covenant blessing. He was of the seed of Abraham. He was an Israelite. And he left the place that God had put him. He left the house of bread, the place of spiritual blessings, the place of physical blessings as long as he stayed true to God. But he left that place when the first obstacle came along. Just as truly as Abraham's life, all the rest of his earthly sojourn was tied up with misery and discord in the home because of his excursion down into Egypt. You remember it was there that he got Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid. Oh yes, at first he thought that uh, he would uh, ease the work on his wife, and so I think he had a very good motive, don't you? So he got Hagar as a servant a slave and handmaid for his wife and she was to help in the chores and she was to help with the cooking and the house keeping and all of that. But it wasn't too long before he had other ideas besides helping Sarah. And he tried to help God out. And as a result of the union which was absolutely displeasing for, for, to God, absolutely contrary to the whole plan of God, Ishmael was born. And when Abraham was disgraceful 
He disgraced God, the God of Israel. He disgraced himself in his own name and was literally kicked out of the land by a pagan king. A pretty sorry spectacle for a prince of God being kicked out because he had lower moral standards than a pagan king. But when he left, he left and he went back to the land of promise. And when he left, he took Hagar and Ishmael back with him. And that was the source of the discord and the strife in the home. And he never had peace and contentment and happiness in the home with Sarah as long as Hagar and Ishmael stayed in the home. And until he finally cut all the ties with the world and cast out Hagar and Ishmael, then peace and harmony reigned. And so just as true as was the case with Abraham, when you go down into the world, you bring back some of the things of the world with you even when you come back. There are scars which you got down the land of Egypt even after you return back to the place of blessing. And for every bit of forbidden pleasure which he received in the land of Egypt, Abraham paid 10,000 times over all of the afterlife. So it will be with any Christian who goes down into Egypt, who goes back to the world, for every ounce of forbidden pleasure that he may roll as a sweet morsel under his tongue, there's a terrible price to pay in years of retribution. And so it was with Elimelech. Let's see what happened. And the name of the man was Elimelech. Now wait a minute. What does Elimelech mean? Elimelech was a man under the covenant of blessings which God had promised to Abram back in Genesis, the 12th chapter. He had received, in fact, the first two letters of his name show his blessings under God because E-L is one of the Hebrew names for God. And so Elimelech was a man who was God's man to start with. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the, no, the words in Scripture, of course, the names of Scripture have terrific significance. Oftentimes today, nicknames are much more significant than the names that our father and mother saddle on us, aren't they? We were talking about how somebody spelled a name today that I, 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 as well as I knew them, I always have trouble pronouncing or remembering how the name is spelt. And I said, but... Uh, there's no rule for pronouncing proper names. I guess I ought to know because who in the world would saddle a name like Beecham on anybody? <laughs> but names in Scripture are very significant. I say oftentimes nicknames today bear much more uh, characteristic descriptions. You see a bunch of kids out on the lot and they'll say, Hi, Fatty, they don't mind whether they're hurting the boy's feelings or not. He may be a regular butterball, but they don't mind that. Kids can be pretty cruel, can't they? Or they say skinny or something else, you know. But the word Naomi means pleasant. Wasn't Elimelech blessed to have a wife that was pleasant? <laughs> I knew I ought to get some amen from that. <laughs> yeah, instead of a nagger. Instead of one who was constantly raising sand over the smallest things, he married a wife. God gave him a wife who was pleasant. I remember during our early married life in Fort Worth, Texas, a good friend and I, whenever our, his wife or mine would, uh, would even raise the slightest objection to anything we wanted to do, we'd say, we'd quote the scripture, it's better to live, in a, in, to live on a housetop alone than in a wide house with a brawling woman. <laughs> and those women got the idea that we only knew two scriptures that was one of them <laughs> that was one of them the other was wives submit yourselves unto your husbands 
<laughs> but you know, just like women will, they always have the last word, and so they found a few of their own too. <laughs> All right, the word Naomi meant pleasant. I say, this man was blessed of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have been born in Bethlehem of Judea, the house of bread? Wouldn't it be wonderful? It is wonderful to live with a Naomi, isn't it? A pleasant wife. And the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his sons, two sons, Malon and Kilion. And boy, they seemed like that they family degenerated a little bit because the names of those two sons, Malon and Kilion, mean, Malon means sickly or a sick person. And Kilion means wasting away. That's right. And so I say the family degenerated as it went along, from Elimelech and Naomi to sickly and wasting away. Why was that? I think it was because even in their names. I think it was a foretelling of God's judgment upon the family for leaving the land of promise and going to live among pagan people. We'll see where, he, where they went. They went to the country of Moab, it says. And so we find this family, Elimelech, Naomi, Malan, and Kilion, going into the land of the Moabites. Now wait a minute. The Moabites were the enemies of God's people. The Moabites had a pretty sorry history all down through the ages. The Moabites began with the sin of Lot, the unspeakable sin of Lot with his daughter in the cave just after the destruction of the city of Sodom. The eldest daughter who committed the sin with her father as a result of that heinous crime against God and humanity, the son was called Moab. The son of the eldest daughter and the son of the second daughter was named Ben Ami, and she was the ancestress of the Ammonites. And the Moabites and the Ammonites have been long time perennial enemies of God's people. The Moabites, yeah, they were kin, therefore, because of Lot, who was of the descendant of Abraham, of the seed, the family of the people of God. They were kin to God's people. And the Moabites therefore speak to those who have a connection with religion, a connection with God's people. But the Moabites typify mere outward profession, outward connection with God without real heart connection. Empty formalism, ceremonialism, dependence upon going through the forms of religion. Yes, taking the name of God upon your lips but not having Him in your heart. Outward show, but no heart connection with God. Just remotely kin to the people of God. That is what the Moabites stand for in the Scripture. Don't you remember during the wilderness wanderings when Israel had gotten up toward the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey, don't you remember they wanted to go through the land of the Moabites? And the Moabites would not let them go through the land. And God pronounced a curse upon the Moabites there because they were the enemies. They were the unnatural enemies. They were the cruel enemies of the people of God. And God had told Abram way back in the 12th chapter of Genesis, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families or the nations of the earth be blessed. And so the Moabites were the long time perennial enemies of the people of God. All right, let's read on. They, came, they were of Bethlehem, Judea, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now you would have understood. Perhaps it could be almost forgiven 
If in a time of great famine the man was casting around for some bread for his family and he went down into an excursion into a land that he had heard where there was, there was sustenance aplenty and he went down there perhaps from a humanitarian standpoint and a love for his family and all. He went down there but he, that, that wasn't all. He stayed there and continued there. And my friends, God will chasten the continued persistence in disobedience and sin. He'll chasten that a lot more, a lot more severely than he will merely a sin of momentary impulse. This was a predetermined, this was a continued sin. This was something he knew he was wrong. He knew the place of God's choice. And yet he stayed down there in the land of Moab among a pagan people who worship pagan idols and false gods. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Yes. Instead of turning to God in their sorrow and need, they stay on in an alien land. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left and her two sons. Yes. Did that bring them back? You would have thought perhaps that Naomi, pleasant, and the two boys would have seen the chastening of God with the sickliness of those two boys and the death of the father and husband. But they stayed on in the land. They persisted. They did not receive the warnings of God. They thought this was perhaps just a happen chance. We'll see whether it's a happen chance or not. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Oh yes, the spiritual wages of sin is eternal death. An eternal Damnation in hell unless repented of and turned from. But the wages of sin is also physical death in many cases. Over in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, in speaking of a sin on the part of God's people, a certain sin, this happened to be in connection with the observance of the Lord's Supper unworthily, the failure to self-examine, the failure to turn from any conscious sin on the part of God's people and partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily. The Holy Spirit through the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul says, For this cause some are sickly among you and sleep. In other words, because of your sin and disobedience, your deliberate sin and disobedience, when you know it's wrong and yet you go on in it anyway and refuse to turn from your wicked way and your backslidings, said, Sin, when it's conceived, bringeth forth death. Physical death. And there in 1 Corinthians 11, for this cause, because of your persistence, your refusal to repent of a conscious sin in your life, for this cause, said, Many are sickly among you, and some sleep, some die. For sleep in the Scripture is referred to in connection with the death of God's people. Yet we have all these things for our examples. These things of the Old Testament are written for our admonition, for our warning. We have all this. We have observation around every time that God's inexorable laws are 100% operative and yet still backslidden Christian people will go on in their own stubborn way hardening their necks and their hearts against the call of God to repentance. When God says let the wicked forsake his way. This is actually a verse for a passage to the backslider. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. Well, the unsaved person has never been with the Lord, never been to the Lord. But here God's talking to backsliders. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. And let him return to the Lord. For he will have mercy 
and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. I say this is no encouragement for God's people to sin, but it's a wonderful blessing to know that when we do sin, we have that sort of a Savior. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. Not only did they stay there in the land of disobedience, they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. Isn't that a long, long time for a person who has had covenant relationship with God, one of God's children, to stay away from Him, to stay away from the place of blessing, from staying, stay away from obedience. And I say not only did they stay in that alien land, but the two sons enter into permanent alliances with the enemies of God and His people. God says, Why art thou a friend of mine enemies? And yet those two boys got their eyes on good-looking girls and they absolutely forgot the admonitions of God. They ignored the fact of separation that God has constantly enjoined upon His people. Separation from the world and the worldlings. God did this as a safeguard to Israel because He knew that when a young Israelite young man fell in love with a beautiful pagan girl. It wouldn't be long before he would be worshiping at the shrine of her pagan gods. Have you ever known a young lady, a Christian young lady to marry a boy and say, well, I hope I can win him. Hope you can win him nothing. Usually he'll cause you to backslide. That's what he'll do. May I say that the first step here of these young men because the choice to leave the land of covenant blessings was not theirs, but their mothers and their mother and dads. But the first step in their downfall was when they ignored God's in commandment for separation. And they got their eyes. The first step was when they've had the first dates with those pagan girls, those Moabitish women. And my friends, the first step in many a Christian girl's life is when she dates for the first time that lost worldling, that lost man. For God's law is eternal and inexorable. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath light and darkness? What concord hath the children of God with the children of Belial? How can two walk together when they're going in opposite directions? One's on the road to hell, the other's on the road to heaven. How can they walk together? And yet, when they first begin dating lost young people, that's the first dangerous step. And so they, these two sons enter into permanent alliance with the enemies of God and His people. They disregarded God's direct prohibitions. Turn with me to Ezra, the ninth chapter. Read the first four verses with me. Now, if I had time, we'd read the whole context. This is when Ezra, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, they lead the people of God back after captivity in Babylon. God had blessed them and allowed them to lead a contingent of, of Jews back to the J Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the city. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, Ezra saying, he, Ezra was the priest of God. The people of Israel and the priests, and they said the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. 
doing according to their abominations. In other words, worshiping as their gods, going to the same shows, participating in the same dances, doing the same worldly things that the worldlings do. Doing according to their abominations. Even the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites and the Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. All these pagan people. And they did even according to their abominations. And brother, I'll tell you this. The quickest way for a Christian to begin to do according to the abominations of this present evil world is to company with that crowd. First thing you know, they'll be telling them, well, everybody's doing so and so. Everybody that they run with. Whenever a man gets to popping off and says there are no virtuous women left, you know the kind of crowd he's been running with, don't you? Immediately, out of his own mouth, he condemns himself. Doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken their daughters for themselves. In other words, they broke down the line of demarcation between the people of God and the world. That's exactly what Christian people do today when they intermarry with the world. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment, I tore my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. The trouble is today people's hearts have grown so hard that they can sit under the words of the God of Israel and still complacently go on in their sin, acting as if it's not so bad after all. Brother, whenever anybody can sit under my preaching or my teaching, when they're indulging in deliberate, willful disobedience and sin, and when they can be comfortable in their sins, then I've backslidden as well as they have. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Then look at verse 12. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that she may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for inheritance to your children forever. Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. And I quoted that a while ago, but I want you to know, it does not beat you Vic speaking, it's the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 6. Verses 14 to 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He said, what do you mean by defiling the temple of God? Which temple are ye? You remember, of course, I've told you so many times through the years, I'm glad to see a lot of new members in the class tonight too, and I haven't told you, but I'm telling you now, in the Old Testament, according to the law of God, those who would be guilty of defiling the temple of God should be cast out and stoned to death under the law of Moses. That was God's judgment 
upon those who would be guilty of defiling the sacred precincts of the house of God. Now here, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is making this application. What do you mean by joining your body with the body of one who's contrary to the law of God and the word of God? You're defiling the temple of the living God. Which temple are ye? In the Old Testament, God affixed that terrible, terrible punishment of swift trial and death upon those who'd be guilty of defiling the temple of God. That's so that the people of today can see the unchanging, unchangeable attitude of God toward one who'd be guilty of defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost, which temple ye are. Oh, you say, well, God doesn't command us to stone people to death or to do that today. No. God says, now judgment is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. But he will repay. Don't forget that. All right, verse 5. And Balaam and Kilion died. The sickly one died and the one finally wasted and plumb away. <laughs> and Malan and Kilion died also both of them and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Again another demonstration. Sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. Again, for this cause, some are sickly among you, and some sleep. Verse 6, And then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. Finally, it seems that Naomi is saying it's enough. God has taken my husband. God has brought my two sons into ill health. Now God has taken them in death. That's enough. I'm going back to the place of blessing. Turning my back on the land of pagan idolatry. Turning my back upon the enemies of God's people. For God said that in the day that thou stoodest with them, thou wast as one of them. Therefore God says, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and be not partakers of their woes. She might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return unto the land of Judah. And Nehemiah said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that, he may find, that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. I know a lot of young women today that wouldn't weep in leaving their mother-in-law, would you? Here we find Naomi finally coming to her senses and saying, I'm going back home. I'm going back to the Father's house. I'm going back to the house of bread. Why? Because a child of God out of place, out of the place of obedience and service and consistent Christian living, not only suffers the consequences himself, but he's a stumbling block to others. And Naomi could have no testimony. Her husband could have no testimony. And those two sickly sons could have no testimony to those Moabitish women. As long as they were out of the place of obedience and consistent living. They were stumbling blocks to others. And so Naomi said, now you go back and you find husbands as good looking as you girls are. You'll have no trouble finding your husband. Because it was unthinkable in those days that a young woman wouldn't have a husband. And so she said, you know, 
You can find husbands among your own people. She said, I, I'm old, well stricken years. I'll have, my husband's dead. I'll have no more sons to raise up. And besides that, you wouldn't wait that long for them, would you? Now you go back. You can dwell among your own people and you'll find a place of fruitfulness among your own people. Verse 14, And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now I think in these next few verses, 16 and 17, I think one of the sweetest, most beautiful passages in all the Word of God. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. You say, that's wonderful, isn't it? She must have loved her mother-in-law. Wait a minute. It was more than just love for her mother-in-law. She had seen the consequences of living there and of God's people living there in disobedience. She'd seen the hand of God operating in that family. And somehow... God's judgment seemed to lead her to repentance. She said, Not only entreat me not to leave thee to return from following after thee, but where thou goest, I'll go. Where thou lodgest, I'll lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And there's the verse, the great eternal decision that Ruth made to turn from her Moabitish idols to turn from the pagan gods of her people, to break all ties. She meant business. Conversion is turning around, a right about face. That's what repentance is, a right about face. And Ruth said, I'm breaking all ties. I'm leaving my own people. I'm leaving the old associations. I'm leaving the old habits. And thy God shall be my God from here on out. Thy God, my God, where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Isn't that beautiful? I say it's not only an affirmation of undying loyalty and love, but it's the record of a conversion of a great woman. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. I like that. Self-will had taken her out, but grace brought her back home. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. It came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said, Call me not Naomi, pleasant. Call me Mara. Why Mara? The word Mara means bitterness. Don't you remember at the waters of Mara when they first, when the children of Israel first got out of, out of Egypt? They camped by the waters of Mara. They saw that spring there in the wilderness in a place, a howling, dry desert. And they saw the springs there and they camped there. But when they went to drink of the water, they found there were bitter waters. And that would not only not quench their thirst, it would increase their thirst and intensify their longing, their thirst. And so what they do? God had a remedy. God had, they were disappointed. They had done their best. They had sought for water and they had found it, but it was the waters of bitterness that they found. And so God had a remedy. God said, see that tree lying over there? He said, take that tree. Well, what in the world would do that? What good would that do? He said, take that tree and cast it into the waters. And the waters became sweet. Wonderful to cool the thirst of man and beast, besides giving them good baths. The waters of bitterness, the waters of Mara became sweet waters. Why? Because of the tree that was cast into it according to the directions of God. And so my friends, when we do our best from a human standpoint, 
seeking to alleviate our sinful condition, we'll find nothing but the waters of bitterness. But God provided a tree. It was the tree, the old rugged cross. And when that cross is thrown into the waters of bitterness, it's an antidote provided by God to the waters of bitterness, and those waters become sweet. They become the water of life for thirsty souls. Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Yes. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of harvest. Wait a minute. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of harvest. You know, it's always the time of harvest when God's disobedient children come home in confession of their sins. I say it's always the time of harvest when backsliders get right with God. Turn with me. That was proven so out of the bitter experience, the Mara experience of David, the 51st Psalm. Starting with verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He wasn't trying to alibi his dirty, sinful, filthy condition before God, was he? It was after his great sin with Bathsheba. He cried, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Why do you say that, David? Because David said in substance, because by experience, I know the truth of the Scripture that says the way of the transgressor is hard. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Did he have any broken bones in his body? No. It was anguish of spirit that was just as poignant and severe in its suffering as would a broken bone sticking out through the flesh, a jagged broken bone. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Remember, David didn't say, Restore unto me thy salvation. David had never lost that, but he lost the joy of salvation. He certainly had had no communion, no fellowship with God while in that backslidden condition. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You know, one of the most miserable persons on this earth is a sorry, backslidden, low-down Christian. Not only out of step with God, out of step with God's people, but he's one of the chief showcases of the devil before a wicked world. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, then when, Lord, after you've forgiven me, after you've given me back the joy that I knew whence first I found the Lord when I walked with you and talked with you, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto you. In other words, I can win souls when I get right with you. I say it's always the time of harvest when God's disobedient children come home in confession of their sins. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Yes, make me a soul winner again. Make me so that I can write another psalm that will be in the same category as the 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness and so on. Make me again so that I can be a pliable instrument in thy hand to teach others thy ways. Sinners shall be converted unto thee. And that, of course, reminds us inevitably of that great soul winner's verse in Psalms 126, verse 6. Psalms 126, 6. That familiar verse, He that goeth forth in weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless, no question in the world about it, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Yes, I've given you this little outline of that verse before for some of the new ones and to renew the rest of you. By way of remembrance, we find in there the elements of soul winning. First, the go in soul winning. You've got to go where lost people are. If you're going to catch fish, you've got to go where the fish are. Wouldn't you think a guy's a nut if he sat there on the curbstone, even on a rainy day and the gutter was full, if he put his, uh, threw his line over there in the gutter? To catch fish, you've got to go where the fish are. There's, a, there's a go in soul winning. He that goeth forth and weeping and weepeth. That's the... Compassion in soul winning. The word compassion means to suffer with. He that goeth forth and weepeth. That's compassion in soul winning. You've got to love souls before you're going to do much about keeping them out of hell. He that goeth forth and weepeth. The goals in soul winning. The compassion in soul winning. Bearing precious seed. There's the word of God in soul winning. Don't you remember the parable of our Lord? The, good, the field is the world and the good seed is the word of God. That's the word of God in soul winning. The gospel it is. That's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believe it. Not your words or mine. But it's the gospel. That's the word of God in soul winning. Shall doubtless come again. That's the certainty in soul winning. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. That's the joy in soul winning. And to the child of God, there is no joy like the joy of winning a soul except the joy of salvation yourself. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's the results of soul winning. Bring your sheaves with you. When you go fishing, be sure you string your fish. Not just to win them and leave them out there floundering on the bank, but you bring them down the aisles. You bring them to the place where they can be not like a little helpless baby left out on the doorstep to freeze to death, but bring him into the house of God. The results of soul winning. It's, seven, it's 8.45. Let's stand. <laughs>